Well, good morning. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Can we just give God the praise this morning? He's given me the opportunity to be with you today, and I am so grateful. Please have a seat. Wow, you guys are amazing. You set the bar high today. <laughs> It is awesome to be with you. And can we take a moment to welcome all of those that are watching online and our South location this morning? So David mentioned we had our Freedom Conference this weekend. It has been an incredible weekend, yes. And so there were so many people that had their lives set free and there was a huge team of people that led the way this entire weekend. So not only do I wanna honor those people that served the entire weekend, I think some of them had sleeping bags all over the building, they were here so much. But I also wanna take a moment to honor our incredible pastors that cast a vision for people to be set free here at Grow Church. So can we honor that team and our pastors this morning? So my name is Josie. My husband and I, we have been married for 25 years. We have two incredible adult kids. And Grow Church has radically changed our lives. We love being a part of this house and this family. We've been so blessed. And so we have been in a series called Wonderful Things. And if you have not seen all of the messages, please go back and take a listen because there are so many nuggets of God's truth that he wants to impart to you through the teachings that our pastors have done the last several weeks. And next week, Pastor, C Pastor Tracy is going to wrap up the Wonderful Things series, so you don't want to miss it. So before we get into the message, I figured I would show you some things that I think are really wonderful. You know, when we get excited about something, girls, we like to tell everybody, right? So here's the first thing. For those of you that thought this was a hemorrhoid pillow, <laughs> I'm so sorry that was your first thought, but now we know how to pray for you. It is actually an ear pillow. And I use this at night to sleep because I'm a side sleeper. And I wake up in the morning and I have such incredible pain in my ears. So when I use this, I put my little ear right through the hole and I have no pain. <laughs> it's pretty wonderful. I love it. Then one of my favorite resources I've been reading is a marriage book. And it's called The Seven Levels of Intimacy by Matthew Kelly. This book has been absolutely incredible. My husband and I have been going through it and just learning so much about one another. And it's been a great resource. And I do have to say this. I feel like sometimes the enemy is working harder on our marriages than we are. So if it's been a while since you studied some new things for your marriage and how to make your marriage stronger, grab this resource. We have it in the bookstore today or you can get it online. Don't miss an opportunity to build and grow your marriage. But do those things transform my life? No. They might make some aspects of my life a little bit better, right? but they don't actually transform my life. So if they don't transform my life, if things don't transform my life, what does? Well, it's not what, it's who? Jesus, right? Jesus transforms our lives. And in order to experience his wonderful things in our life, we need to be leading a life that is filled with transformation. And so I've titled the message today, Transformed Living. Because if there's one thing that I want you to get out of, out of today, this is it. That developing a healthy fear of the Lord will lead you to a transformed life. Amen. So every weekend before we get into the message, we always say a declaration together to get our hearts and minds ready to receive what God wants to share with us and also to get rid of any of the distractions that might have been going on this morning. So repeat after me. Today... I will hear the voice of God, through the word of God. My eyes will be enlightened, and I will be changed. And go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, I will be changed. So we're going to talk today about Jesus and his disciples. 
Jesus had 12 disciples that were essentially students, and he chose them, he handpicked them to follow him and to learn from him, and he wanted to impart things to them in the time that he walked this earth. And what was interesting is that the disciples that he chose, they really didn't have their lives all figured out. They weren't living these perfect Christian lives that we think that they have needed to live in order to be able to follow Jesus. They were a little bit of a mess. But yet these disciples made a massive impact on the lives of those around them while at the same time their lives were being transformed. But here's what I found really special, is that these disciples chose to follow Jesus even though the things that he was teaching, they were some hard truths. Like Jesus didn't sugarcoat anything for them. He was telling people things that they really needed to hear, not just what they wanted to hear. And so we see in scripture, maybe, there we go. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, we'll find it. Jesus was teaching them hard truths. He was saying things like, anger is the equivalent to murder, and lust is the same as adultery. He said, pray for those that persecute you, and to love others, and to not be anxious, and to forgive others, and don't sin in your anger. Why would they follow him when it obviously was not going to be so easy? I think maybe it's just because they weren't satisfied how things were in their lives. That they knew that there was something more, but maybe they didn't know how to get there. Maybe they understood that anything without sacrifice doesn't produce miraculous results. So maybe you're here today and you're in that same spot. You know you don't want things to say, stay the same way that they are, but you're not really sure what to do. And I believe it's that season of sacrifice, that stretching, that will allow God to do a work in you. Like, have you ever made a big decision, like maybe going away to college or moving to a different state, starting a, a business or even a new job? Why would we do some of those things? They're hard, right? They require sacrifice. But it's in those moments that we're stretched and we learn and grow and we are able to experience his wonderful things that come out of some of those transformation seasons in our lives. And maybe this is what the disciples knew deep down, that even though it was so uncomfortable for them, that there was nothing greater than following Jesus. They were in awe of him. He was the Messiah. He was the one that they had been waiting for. And they knew that they had to share everything about Jesus with everyone that they came in contact with. They were being transformed as they spent time with him. And to experience his wonderful things, we must be living out a life that is transformed. So I'm going to talk to you specifically about one of the disciples today, and that's Peter. Peter is like one of my favorites because when Jesus found Peter, he was a fisherman, and he was one of those guys that was really rough around the edges. Like, have you ever been around somebody that has no filter at all, and they just say whatever they're thinking? It can be a little dangerous sometimes. But Peter was super emotionally driven Yet Peter was influential, but not necessarily in a really good way. But here's the thing. After he spent time with Jesus, he became wise and mature. He became bold and empowered. And he became influential, but this time in a really good way. See, Peter allowed God to shape his life and transform his life. And Peter... And I believe the other disciples as well, they had to learn to lay aside some things in order to follow Jesus. They had to die to their se- themselves when it came to their own maybe anger. Maybe they had some pride issues they had to learn to set aside 
or some jealousy. Maybe somebody else was catching more fish than they were. Maybe some control or rebellion. But in order to follow Jesus, they had to learn and be in a process of laying these things aside so that they could have everything that Jesus wanted to have for them. But Peter had some significant ups and downs in his life. And we see that God still used him to be a part of wonderful things. In fact, Peter got to see multitudes of people come and get healed. He got to see miracles take place all over everywhere they went. And so we're going to look at a few portions of scripture where we see where Peter was directly involved in some, experiencing some wonderful things with Jesus. And we see in Matthew 14 that Peter, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase these scriptures because there are so many of them. So in Matthew 14, 28 through 29, Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on water when Jesus called him. I mean, can you imagine the kind of faith that it took to even take that first step out of the boat? He walked on water. I can't even imagine that. And then in Mark chapter 5, 35 to 42, Peter went with Jesus to see Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. He got to experience a girl raised from the dead. And there was something significant about Peter's faith because when Jesus went on this mission, he chose Peter and James and John only to be with him. So there had to be something about Peter's faith that led him to this opportunity of experiencing this incredible, wonderful thing. And then we see in Acts chapter 2, 14 through 41, Peter actually spoke in front of 3,000 people and he led them all to Christ. And then in Acts chapter 3, 6 through 10, we see, oh, that's not there yet. We see that God used Peter to heal a beggar. Peter was able to experience these incredible things because he was living out a life that was being transformed. But if you're like me at all, maybe before I started getting into the word, I had some preconceived notions that everybody in the Bible was amazing all the time. They never messed up. They never had any issues. And that's not the truth. And I had to study and I had to learn, did Peter actually ever mess up? And I needed to know because I needed to know if it was too late for me. And we see that Peter did make some mistakes. He did mess up. And so I'm going to share a portion of scripture in Luke chapter 22 where Jesus is actually preparing Peter for what's about to take place. He's letting Peter know, I'm about to be arrested. And we see in Luke 22, Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Wait a second. Peter was feeling brave. He was feeling really confident in that moment. That's a bold proclamation to say, I'm going to go with you, not just to prison, but I'll go with you to death. And so Peter's just stirred up in his face saying, I've got your back, Jesus. I'm with you. But then what happens? Shortly, we af shortly after this, we see that Judas, one of the disciples as well, betrays Jesus. And then Peter has this moment where he sees Jesus getting arrested. And, he, and there's something that takes place. There's something that shifts possibly within his faith where he's a little nervous. There's some tension, maybe some fear that rises up in him. And it says in scripture that he started following them from a distance. So he already created that space. And then we see that there's two people that come up to Jesus. And the first is a servant girl and she comes up to him and she says, weren't you with Jesus? And he looks at her and says, no, 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 not me. It wasn't me. And then yet a second girl comes up to Jesus or comes up to Peter and says, you're, you're with him. You're one of those guys that were with Jesus. And he says, nope, not me. I don't know what you're talking about. And so we're going to pick up in the portion of scripture where it's the third one that comes up to Peter. And says, after an interval of about an hour still, another 
insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered, he remembered in that moment the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter, he went out and wept bitterly. Have you ever let someone down? Have you ever disappointed someone? I know I have. And I believe Peter in that moment had great remorse. I believe his heart was broken once he realized the reality of what he had done. He was operating in his own strength and he was weak without relying on the powerment of God. But as soon as he recognized what he did, immediately as he recognized what he did, he wept bitterly. And I believe that was his heart's cry and his act of repentance and coming back to the love of the Father and coming back to the fear of the Lord. You see, Peter failed miserably, yet he learned from his mistakes and he became an even greater voice for Jesus. So you remember when I, read, when I shared you that part about Acts chapter 2 where he led 3,000 people to Christ? That actually came after this. It came after he denied Jesus three times. He did not allow his mistakes and his failures to define him. And so we can learn from that to not allow our mistakes and our failures to define us. But like Peter, when I met Jesus, I was a mess. I was a complete mess. I, I said the salvation prayer. I asked Jesus into my heart when I was 17, but I wasn't actually living for him. I did on the days that it was convenient for me, but on the days when we were going to go to the bar and it wasn't so convenient, I didn't actually live for him that day. It just depended on what I wanted for the day. And so I had all sorts of ups and downs in my life, and I started to make some really bad decisions after going to the bars on a regular basis. And it would lead me into a place of shame and guilt to where I would spend days or even weeks feeling so shameful for the mistakes that I had made. And I didn't realize that I just had to ask God for his forgiveness. And so once I learned about God's grace, his unmerited favor, and his forgiveness, I was able to come to him and say, God, I'm so sorry. Help me and turn my life around. Except for me. I like to go to extremes with things. So I went from feeling shameful all the time to then using and abusing God's grace like it was my own get-out-of-jail-free card from Monopoly. <laughs> and so here's the thing. I believe that God doesn't want us to abuse his grace. I was throwing an apology an empty apology up in the air, believing that I was forgiven, but I wasn't actually thinking twice about what I had done. And so God wants us to come to him with that repentant heart because his grace is free. It's a gift from him, but it is a gift that cost him everything. I wasn't honoring God in the way that I was living my life. I wasn't stewarding that gift I was hurting him with the decisions I made. And so I had to recognize and have my eyes open to the beautiful gift that it actually was and begin to treasure it. Because if we're not careful, we can dishonor his grace. We can abuse his grace unintentionally. So if we have that moment where we ask him to come into our hearts, to come into our lives, but then we just go about and do the same things that we were doing previously, it's a way that we take advantage of him. And that is not his goal for our lives. He gave us grace, but he also gave us his strength so that we don't have to do it on our own. I can't do this life on my own. I desperately need the Holy Spirit. 
And he wants us to live lives that are transformed by his goodness, his love, his empowerment, and his grace. And it took me almost 20 years after I initially said that prayer to really allow God to do the work in my life. I came to a place where I wanted more of Jesus and less of myself. And I was so consumed with my own family and everything and just in my life that I knew that there had to be more, that God wanted to use me somehow to make a difference. And so I decided to fully and completely give my life to him. And in doing so, over the years, I've recognized that one of the biggest areas in my life that I've learned the most in, and it's created the most impact for me, is developing a healthy fear of the Lord. And what I mean by the fear of the Lord is that place of absolute honor and coming under him and his authority and allowing him to be the complete ruler of my life. His ways are so much better than my ways. His plans are so much better than my plans. And so I learned that he wasn't just some big guy in the sky trying to take me out for every little bad thing that I did all of the time. But the fear of the Lord was more of a positioning of my heart. I had to be willing to come under and recognize that his ways were far above my ways. And so we're going to dive into what is the fear of the Lord. And so I'm reading a book right now, and you can find this one in the grocery store too, because I'm really big on resources and getting ourselves educated. Not just so that we can be learners, but we can be teachable and apply the lessons that God's teaching us in our lives. And so the book that I'm reading currently is called The Awe of God, and it's by John Bevere. And it's his new book, and he talks about the fear of the Lord, and he dives deep in it, and it is absolutely incredible. I am learning so much in this book. And he breaks down in the book that the fear of the Lord is so much more than just our awe or respect for God. But it's also about our actions, living out our lives as a person that is transformed by God's grace. And so to fear, the God, to fear God is to honor, worship, and praise him not just for the things that he does for us, but for who he is. I know a lot of times I'll go to God with my laundry list of items that I need to have him check off my prayer list rather than just taking that time to honor him and praise him. And then to fear the Lord is to hate what God hates, which is sin. God doesn't just hate sin because it's wrong, but because it hurts us. And because it separates us from him. And he doesn't want anything to separate you from him. And then to fear him is to be transparent before him. We've got to get real before our heavenly father. Because it's him who does the transforming. And let's be honest, he knows what's going on anyway. So we might as well just be raw and real with him and share it anyhow. Because then I feel like once we do that, he knows that there's a willingness in our heart so that he can mold us and shape us. And then to fear God means we obey him. We obey his word, whether we feel like it or not, whether we understand it all the time or not, we do it simply because he said so. And he knows far greater than we do. And that's when we do it in his strength not in our own strength. And to fear him means to allow him to shape us, to mold us according to his ways, according to his perfect plan. Even if it means that we've got to get a little bit uncomfortable. The thing about the fear of the Lord is that it's always for our benefit. Like we think it's all about him, but realistically, our God is so good that when we give to him, when we fear him, when we honor him, when we praise him, he so generously gives back to us. And there's benefits that come from the fear of the Lord. And those benefits are, we draw closer to him. He protects us when we have a healthy fear of the Lord. We can hear from him greater. It draws us closer to him. He gives us insight and wisdom 
We see in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So if so much of transformation in our lives come from the fear of the Lord, we need to learn how to develop a greater fear of the Lord. And one of those ways is to intimately, intimately grow in your love for Jesus. That happens when you're spending time with him daily. You develop that greater trust for him where you can surrender your life to him. Let's be honest, you can't trust someone that you don't know. But if you're new here today and you're new to a relationship with Jesus, just know this. He loves you and he wants a relationship with you. And he wants you to come to him today just as you are. And another way that we develop a greater fear of the Lord is to die to our sin. We've got to get rid of our sin, die to ourselves, which means getting rid of some of those anxieties, those anger issues, fear, pride, lust, sexual immorality, addictions, anything that would separate us from him. We've got to lay it down and we've got to learn new ways and renew our mind with his word. One of those for me that I've been in a continual process with is control. I'm, I'm getting better. <laughs> Don't look at my husband. I am getting better. But if there is a situation that I can't control with my kids, anybody know maybe what that's like to not be able to control a situation with your kids? And that anxiousness, that pain, that stress of like, oh, I can just fix your problem for you rises up, it's a pain, right? And that pain can start to control our lives. But when we give it over to the Lord, when we give him that control and say, God, I can't control the situation with my kids. I surrender them completely to you. He loves them more than we do anyways, which is hard for me to imagine, but he does. And so when we surrender them to him and say, God, I give you control over my kids. I surrender them to you. Guess what happens? We exchange our pain for his peace. And so that control starts to die, and I get to live out a life of peace. Dead things are not in pain. If there is an area of your life that you still feel pain in, it's likely because it's not dead yet. And the more that we die to ourselves, the more of God's peace we can receive and there's so much freedom that comes from his peace. One of those ways that I die to myself is trying to figure out where that line is sometimes. You know, the line between right and wrong. I like to stand right on it for a lot of years of my life. Like a small wind wouldn't just knock me over into the other side. <laughs> when I was 19, I lived a life of partying on the weekends. And then the weekends turned into every night. And every night turned into all day. So it was all day, every day, for about the better part of a year. Until one day I woke up and I looked back and I saw the line was so far away, I could barely even see it anymore. And God has so much better for us. See, I wasn't spending any time with him. I didn't give him any part of my day. I was just focused on what I wanted. See, Satan talked angels out of heaven. Don't think that he can't talk you past that line. We've got to stay on the right side of the line. And the beautiful part is we don't even have to figure out where the line is because God determines the line. So when we're reading his word and studying what he wants to share with us, that's where we'll know where that line is because the line protects us. And we can do this through taking a look at our lives. We do it from a place of self-evaluation. Take a look at some of the things that are going on in your life. What are you spending your time on? Who are you spending your time with? Are you living your life for God? Or are you living your life for yourself? And I don't mention all of this to condemn or make anyone feel overwhelmed. In fact, if you leave here today and try to fix every area of your life, God help you. I tried that. 
It does not work. You just become super stressed out and even more anxious. But take a look at one area of your life, and God will show you that one area. And give it to him. Ask him to transform you in that one area. Because this isn't to make us about all the things that you're doing wrong, but it's about making those small adjustments as he leads you, as he transforms you, not as you try to change yourself. But we do need to be aware of the things that he is showing us. And as he shows us, even if it's that one thing, we come to a place of repent and surrender. And we, when we repent, it's not like what I told you I had done before, where I just threw that empty apology up into the air thinking that it actually meant something. I knew that it didn't. I'm just trying to check it off my list. But that repentance is, God, I'm so sorry for hurting you, for doing things that would separate me from you. And then I would make an intentional decision not to go back to do those same things again. That is true repentance. And we can give those things by surrendering them to him so that he helps keep us from going back to those old lifestyles. And in our new lifestyle, in our new walk with God, we can develop disciplines in our lives that will keep us safe. Why do we discipline our kids? Just for fun? Not so much. It's not fun at all, actually. But we discipline them to keep them safe, to protect them, right? We want to teach them ways so that they stay away from harm, so they don't end up in horrible situations throughout their life. We want to protect them. But I think so many of us have been raised with this notion that discipline is actually a bad word. Like when you're younger and you're in school and you're in trouble, you get disciplined. Or when you get home and mom says, dad's coming home, you knew you were going to be disciplined. But I think the enemy has done a really good job of twisting that word around because I think that was actually punishment. Because discipline actually is for our benefit. It provides freedom in our lives. When we're disciplined to the ways of the Lord, we don't have to experience all the chaotic results of our own living. Disciplines, they guard our heart. They guard our life. You cannot live a holy life without living a disciplined life. Jesus paid far too great a price for your life for you to live it aimlessly. So is there an area of your life that God is calling you higher? If so, it's probably going to be an area that he's going to require a greater level of discipline in you from. Like, is he calling you to spend more time with him and be healthy and have energy so that you can fulfill the call of God on your life? If so, he may likely be calling you to a greater level of discipline in exercise and eating healthier. Both of those benefit our lives, but it takes intentional discipline. Or if he's calling you to a space of hearing clearly from him more, it might take a discipline of spending more time with him. And not more time just talking to him, but more time just sitting with him, abiding in his presence, listening to him, waiting to hear his voice. See, wonderful things happen when we obey God, when we follow Jesus and when we love him and we love others. It's then that we're able to advance the gospel because we're not living in the chaos of our own junk anymore. It's about loving Jesus and loving others. But can we get real and honest for a moment? Sometimes it's not so easy, though, to love the people that don't love you back, is it? The ones that don't appreciate you, take you for granted, the ones that kind of act like jerks. But realistically, it can be those people that cause you to grow. It can be those people that stretch you and force you into learning to recognize and believe the best about others. People can make you kinder and wiser and more patient if you allow them to. Or they can make you frustrated and bitter. That choice is completely up to you. And we see in, in scriptures in 1 Peter it says, he called you 
out of darkness to experience his marvelous light. And now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. There's so much he has in store for you. There's so much he wants you to be a part of. You see, Peter didn't wait until his life was completely changed and transformed before he stepped out into the call of God for his life. Peter actually had a lot of challenges in his life. His life was not free from problems. Peter was embarrassed. He was beaten. He was arrested, imprisoned. And ultimately, Peter was crucified on a cross upside down. Peter knew God. He feared him. He obeyed him and loved him through his life until the very end. Peter had an eternity mindset, and he allowed God to transform his life while he went out and transformed other lives. Peter lived a life full of wonderful things, but he also lived a life full of challenges. And I know for me, when I was going through one of the greatest challenges in my life, one of the darkest seasons in my life, I knew that I couldn't quit. I couldn't give up on God because I knew that there were people that desperately needed to know about Jesus. So I had to keep showing up. And here's the really cool part about God is that even when you're going through one of your hardest times, in the middle of your hardest moments, you can be the answer to someone's prayers. Have you ever gone through anything painful? Any difficult situations? I bet God taught you something from it, right? I bet he challenged you and stretched you in that season. Don't make your pain be in vain. Share those things that you went through with others. Jesus experienced an unimaginable death so that we could experience everything that he has to offer. Don't make his pain ever be in vain. He wants us to get everything out of it. He wants to experience everything that he has given to us. He wants us to live a transformed life full of his wonderful things. So I'm going to go back to my ear pillow for a moment. Should I wait to use this until my sleep's better? Should I wait until I'm not in any pain anymore and then use it? What about the book? Should I wait to read the book until my marriage is stronger? What would be the point, right? Of course not. I'm not going to wait. So why would we wait until our lives are completely straightened out before we allow Jesus to come in and transform us so that we can live out a life being transformed by God's glory and experience his wonderful things? But if you're like me, maybe you're saying I've messed up too much. And that was me. I messed up. I had walked away from God many times. I sinned, and I sinned some more. I lived my life based on my own selfishness. I lied, cheated, manipulated. And worst of all, I have grieved the Holy Spirit. And I can truly relate to a woman in Scripture that Jesus talks to. And he says, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then a verse down, he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. God has made me new. He isn't relentlessly condemning me. 
He is transforming my life and he wants to do the same for you. And here's the wonderful thing about Jesus is that when we have undeniably received his grace and forgiveness and he has set us free, we can't help but want to share his goodness with everyone around us. So I may not have experienced yet some of the wonderful things that Peter's experienced, but I knew that God wanted me to start somewhere. So I started to spend more time with Jesus and get to know his heart. And he taught me how to love people better, how to become a better listener, how to care more, how to get authentic and real and share the things that he had done in my life with others. And he taught me how to give hope by sharing Jesus. And because of that, I have now experienced some of his wonderful things. I've seen relationships redeemed. I've seen minds restored, hearts mended. I've seen physical healings take place. And best of all, I've seen hope received. Because when we give people Jesus, we give them everything they will ever need. And he is here today, and he wants that relationship with you. So if everyone could please bow their head and close their eyes. And if at the south, a location leader could please come forward. You can live out a life that is being transformed. And that starts with knowing Jesus and asking him to come into your heart to make you new so that you can live that life fully for him. Not in your own strength, but in his strength. And so if that's you today and you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart and you want to experience his saving power and grace, I want to ask that you would take a moment and raise your hand in this place. Father, I thank you. I see those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, you're moving. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Or maybe you've come in today and you've recognized that you've loved Jesus all along, but you've been far away from him. You've been so far on the other side of that line that you have lost your fear of the Lord and you want to run back to him today, to run into his arms that have his open embrace ready to receive you because you said that prayer once a long time ago, but you left it there. And you want to reignite your life with him, recommit your life to Jesus. If that's you and you want to recommit your heart to Jesus, I want to ask you to raise your hand in this moment. Oh, Father, I praise you. I praise you, God, all over this place. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to ask if everyone can please repeat after me. Father, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask you, Lord to be my savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. I choose today to live completely for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And I wanna pray over those of you that recommitted your heart back to him today. Father, I thank you. Lord, so many hands were raised in this place today, and I believe it's because the power of the Holy Spirit is working amongst our hearts today, God. You are drawing your children back to you, the safest place that we can be. And so, Father, as they've raised their hands to recommit their hearts and lives to you, Father, I pray that today will be a marked moment, God that you would seal their decision in their heart and their roots would grow down deep in your love, that they would know the depth, the height, the width of your love like never before, Father, that they would feel surrounded by your love and your mighty presence. God, we thank you that from this day forward, they will develop a healthy fear of you and praise your holy and precious name. 
And for all of this, God, we give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God praise this morning?